when we respond to conflict with humility and grace, when we respond to conflict with humility and grace, we provide space for the Holy Spirit to work through us toward reconciliation. The date was 1962, and a young president, John F. Kennedy, just 44 years old, he sits at his desk in decision. He makes moves armies of the most powerful nations in the world. The crisis he faces, if you remember this, is of immense proportion. Photos were taken from a reconnaissance aircraft. One picture in particular revealed that the Soviets had placed medium uh, range missiles, silos in Cuba. They were capable of going anywhere in, in the United States. The risk of world conflict had not been this great since World War II and involved the two greatest superpowers at the time. The president moved decisively, ordering uh, Premier Khrushchev to halt all further deliveries of missiles, of ships, of anything, but he didn't listen. A broadcast to the American people let us know the gravity of the situation. The president said this, and I quote, This secret, swift, extraordinary buildup of communist weapons is a deliberate and unjustifiable challenge to our national security, and it will not be accepted. Many of you may remember that broadcast. America braced for what was to come. President Kennedy ordered the immediate naval air and blockade of Cuba. Premier Khrushchev decided he would test this young president's merit, and he would challenge the nation's resolve as he would confront our convictions. So Soviet ships sailed towards Cuba. The world held its breath in nervous anticipation as hours crept by the ships grew closer and closer to one another. The Soviets determined to press the boundaries, walk the line, just to see how much they can get away with. If you remember watching, they, they, literally the ships were 100 yards apart. The Navy was on full battle alert, ready to stop the Russians at all costs. As you were glued to your TVs and your radios, who would flinch? Who would fire? What would the world look like after this potential nuclear fallout? And with just seconds to spare on the brink of disaster and destruction, the Soviets turned their ships. This incident in world history is parallel to our lives in many ways. You see, a lot of us are in a dangerous game of spiritual brinkmanship, aren't we? We walk the very boundary of sin in our life and our lifestyle. We try to balance precariously as we move towards the edge of the cliff of what is sin? How far should we go? How do we address it? How much do we involve ourselves in it? Dangling our toes ever over the abyss, we tempt the fall. We struggle with bad habits that become self-destructive patterns. At the same time, we're telling people, oh, don't worry about me, I'm a Christian. And all the while, we're having to deal with one another as we all participate in this type of lifestyle. And in this series, we've been talking about conflict. We looked at first where conflict comes from. And we learned conflict comes most obviously from our own pride. We want what we don't have and we do whatever we can to get it. Last week, we looked at how does conflict uh, impact the church. And, and, and we asked that question, and we learned that the church, we are to be involved in one thing, the mission that Jesus Christ has given every church, which is the Great Commission. So we unite around that. And the way we fight conflict in the church when it comes, because it will come. We're sinful people. We, we, we deal with sinful habits, and, and we all have opinions that try to occupy the same space at the same time. So conflict is going to come. Kyle and I are going to have beef, right, Kyle? It happens. So what do we do? What do we do when conflict comes? It's a part of life. No matter how hard we try, we will have conflict in our lives. And, and I, I would imagine here that the vast majority of us have had conflict in our lives this week. If you're a parent and you have a kid right now that's in any way, shape, or form in your house, I would imagine that there's a 100% chance you experienced conflict this morning getting here. See, we got some admission over here. Just yes, right up front, from the kid. <laughs> so what we're going to look at today of how, and this is just a question we're going to ask, how do we respond to conflict in our life? How do we respond to conflict in our life when we have conflict with someone or someone has sinned against us and it's caused conflict? What do we do? 
I want to make an important statement before we really dive into this message. And this is really, really important when addressing sin in other people's lives. Because a lot of times, the conflict may not involve us directly at all, but we'll see sin in someone else's life, and we think it's our duty to go fix that person, don't we? Let me make a disclaimer about doing that. You don't get to call out sin in someone's life that you don't have a relationship with that person. You don't get to do it. If you're not walking with that person, if you don't have a relationship with that person, guess what, guess what it's going to do if you go and jump and call out sin in someone's life you don't have a relationship with? How do you think that's going to go, John? Not well, huh? It's not going to go well at all. See, John calls out sin in my life all the time, and it works well because John and I have a relationship. So I just tell John, thank you, shut up, leave me alone, right? And he just keeps coming back for more. But if we remember our main idea, and this is this, I want to review this. That if we respond to conflict with humility and grace, we will provide the Holy Spirit a space to work in us and through us towards reconciliation. And we're going to look at this from two points this morning. One, from a church perspective. How does the pastor deal with conflict? Like, what is my role in conflict in, in, one, in, in the larger sense? We're not going to get into the details. We'll look at that a little later. And then from that, we're, we're looking at this big overview. But then I want to give you six steps you can take to deal with conflict in your own life. Just six takeaways from the Word of God of how to deal with conflict in your own life. Now, we understand that low-level conflict, it provides us an amazing opportunity to practice the Beatitudes that Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 and to, to grow together in a way that we often seldom don't have the opportunity to do. And so we all have this conflict in our lives, and if you don't now, you will, trust me. And it's important that we deal with this, and one of the reasons we're looking at this is because we need to learn how to deal with conflict, how to approach conflict in a biblically informed manner so that we can honor Christ when it comes. Father God, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, Lord, would you fill us with your spirit? Would you engage our minds as well as our hearts? And would you draw us to yourself through this? As we seek not just to be pragmatic, God, we're not just trying to figure out how can I fix problems in my life. That is not our goal here, but our goal is how do we honor these Christ-centered relationships that you've given us for your glory? How do we stay unified as a church when conflict comes? How do we press on in the mission that you've given us to be disciples who make disciples for your glory? That's our goal, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. So the first thing I want, I want you to know as we dive into this, that the pastors, your pastors are charged with setting the example of how to deal with conflict. Your pastors are charged with setting an example of how to deal with conflict. It would do no good if you saw me in conflict with, one, with someone. You knew I was in conflict with someone. You knew Gene was in conflict or Daniel or Chris or Hayden. You knew one of us were in conflict with somebody. And you knew the way we handled conflict was not a biblical manner. How would that then affect the way you would handle conflict, right? So we, we as pastors, we want to handle conflict. We want to set the example of being humble and gracious in any manner when we have to deal with conflict. And you say, well, why, do we, why are we preaching on this? Quite frankly, because the Bible speaks to it, so we deal with it. And we want to learn how to deal with these things in a godly, Christ-honoring manner. And so what God does, he charges the leader, the pastor of the church, to present the whole counsel of God. And we see this explicitly in 2 Timothy. I want to look at this with us together this morning. It's going to set the stage for kind of why we're doing what we're doing before we dive into the what we're doing. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2-5. through 5. So this is Paul's charge to Timothy as this young pastor. Paul says this to the young pastor. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come where they will not endure a sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, and now he's speaking to him, he says, You be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now this passage is often given to pastors at pastors' conferences to reiterate the work that we have been given. But I want to focus 
in regards to how the pastor is to equip the church. Paul mentions several valuable points here, and I just want to, to highlight four of them for, for us this morning. So you can say, what's the role, what is, what is one of the roles of the pastors of the church? Why are we dealing with this? Why are we walking through this particular series? The first thing we see is that the pastor is responsible to do what? What does Timothy say? And Paul say, he says, Timothy, you are responsible to preach the word. You have a biblical responsibility to take the word of God and preach the word of God. Now, this is what's interesting. He does not say preach just the Old Testament, does he? He doesn't say just preach the New Testament. He doesn't say just preach the parts that you like. He doesn't say just preach the parts that, that are soft. He, does, he, he doesn't say that, does he? He says preach the word. That's the whole word. Everything from Genesis to Revelation preached the entirety of the word. And so what happens as a pastor, sometimes as a preacher, you will be tempted to not talk about certain topics for fear of reprisal from the congregation. You don't want to talk about sex. You don't want to talk about money. You don't want to talk about divorce. You don't want to talk about racism. You don't want to talk about injustice because these things get you looked at real funny. But the beautiful thing is, is that it's not my choice of what to preach. God just gives his word and we preach it. And that's one of the reasons we specifically most often preach through books of the Bible here, because if you're preaching through a book of the Bible, you can't skip a verse, because somebody says, hey, why'd you skip that? I remember when I was preaching through Matthew, and I, I, I was going through the Sermon on the Mount, and I got to Jesus' talk on divorce, and I had only been at, the, uh, at Satsuma for about a year. I was like, I'm not, I'm not here long enough to talk about divorce. There's like 40% of the people in the church divorced, right? And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to do this. So I was like, I was going to skip it. I got nervous, and I was like, got convicted. I said, I can't skip it. So we paused the whole series, and I just did a five-part series on, on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I promise you, not one of those sermons, not one of those five sermons did people say an amen, not one. <laughs> not, not one person on the way out said, preacher, that was a good message this Sunday. Not one. Did, did I necessarily want to have that impact? No, I didn't. But did I have a choice? Not if we're going to be responsible to preach the word of God, the whole counsel. So the, the, the minister is called to preach the whole counsel of God. He preaches the word correctly and consistently because when we do, as what we're doing now, talking about conflict, we're going to provide a foundation for you to be equipped in all of life's issues because that is what God has given us the word for, to equip us for all of life. Second thing the pastor is responsible for is the pastor is responsible for teaching and instructing the body. So as we preach the word, we also teach the word and instruct the body in a manner, and this is important, of which they will understand. I often have people tell me, and they say this is a compliment. I guess they mean it's a compliment, but and it feels weird to me. They say, man, you really preach down to a level I can understand. I'm just dumb, and so that makes me feel like I'm preaching dumb, right? But... And I, they used to worry me. So I, I used to, I look, I used to be like, well, how can I sound smarter? And somebody said, Brad, with your accent, you will never sound smart. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to ever sound like you're not, like you're smart. It's never going to happen. You can use all the big words you want. They're not going to believe you when you say them. <laughs> but one of the greatest compliments I've ever gotten from preaching, it was from a six-year-old little boy. He said, I really liked your sermon. I understood it this morning. And I had a dad tell me, he says, you know, my, my, my daughter takes notes of all your messages. He said, because you can preach in a way that she understands. And, and I remember, this was years ago, I, I said, I, I determined to preach in a manner in such a way that even a six-year-old could understand what we're talking about. There may be some aspects that may be, but the core of the message that even a child can understand. Because if, if, if we, if the person here preaches in a manner that you don't understand, what good is it for you? Our goal, whoever we have here, we want to ensure that you have a firm grasp of the Word of God, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, so that you know the truth, so that when you're called to put the truth of the Word of God in action, you can do it. And so when we discuss hard topics like we're doing right now in this series, we want to accurately present what the Bible has to say, whether we like it, or whether we don't like it, but we want to do it in a way that you understand and that we can all put into action. Third thing that Paul tells young Timothy, he says, you're called, you're responsible for correcting the body. He says, you are called to repro reprove and rebuke. That's correct, the body, when in error. 
So if, if, if we know of glaring sin taking place, unrepentant sin that the church is engaged in, that's causing harm to the body, that's stifling the work of God within the body, it is the duty, it is the obligation of the pastor to confront and address. Because Jesus tells us one thing to me that, that, that burdens me and, and the other pastors we have on staff here, your pastors, that we, every one of us, will have to stand before the Lord and give an account for the how how we shepherded you. How we loved you. How we cared for you. The truth we told you. The things we didn't tell you. Did we correct you in a loving way? Or did we allow you to sin because we didn't want to have the conflict? Yes, we do it out of love. We correct theological errors. We correct, life, correct lifestyle errors. But it's part of the responsibility of the pastor. Because we're held accountable by Christ himself as the chief shepherd. And the fourth thing the pastor responds for doing is protecting the body. He's called to protect the body physically if needed, and more importantly, spiritually. And I remember several years ago when I was at my last church, we had this guy come in, and he wanted to join church, and he kind of jumped all in, and he was doing real well, and, and he wanted to get involved in this particular ministry. And it was a semi-local ministry. He wasn't super involved, but he wanted to get involved in this, this, this homeless ministry a couple towns over. And so we started doing a few things, but then I noticed he started preaching and was going around different Sunday school classes teaching asceticism. And asceticism is basically this, that we should all live as poor as we possibly can in rags and riches to be as poor and as spiritual as we can. Well, I knew that was wrong because Paul actually deals with that in 1 Corinthians. He says people that are preaching that, they're not preaching the gospel, right? So that's a different gospel. So that's not the gospel. And so I had to confront this guy over that. He got, he got irate. He says, he says, you're teaching, you're in error, you're in sin. I'm going to tell the whole church you're in sin. I said, hey, buddy, have at it. Stand up and tell them. And, and, and it was really, we had this like duel on Wednesday night. It was pretty cool. I liked it. And I ended up and said, hey, hey, you're no longer welcome at this church. Now, I know some of you, you were like, oh, you tell somebody they're not welcome. No, if you're teaching error in sin theologically and you will not repent of that, you will be asked to leave. Because our job as pastors is to protect the body. So we take the proper position, position in leadership to reach, teach, protect, and correct. And I showed you this simply, and you say, well, how did, what does it got to do with conflict? Because I want to provide you with a foundation, a rationale for why we're dealing with these hard topics. And so now I want to dive into looking at the proper procedure to address conflict in our life. But I, I want to make this before I do this. This, this statement, this is, this is the most crucial thing. If you really get none of these six steps, I want you to get this. Approaching conflict with the proper attitude will make all the difference in the world. How you, the attitude you bring to someone that you have conflict with will make all the difference in the world. Ruby was born in the Delta region of the Mississippi River in 1954. And in 54, if you remember, the Supreme Court heard a case called the Brown versus the Board of Education. After arguments were made, the high court ruled that separate but equal education for blacks and whites was separate, but it was in no way equal. Segregation officially ended the year Ruby was born, but in reality, it hung on for a long time after. Six years later, Ruby's mom got her ready for her first day of school. Little Ruby wore a white dress. She was so beautiful, and she had a white bonnet on her head. She had all the fears and all the hopes of a, any first grader, plus she had the weight of the state of Louisiana sitting on top of her young shoulders. And only six years old, young Ruby was escorted to her first day of school by 75 federal marshals. Could you imagine the fear in that little baby's heart? When she enrolled, every other student withdrew from school. But their parents were there to greet Ruby on her first day of school. Hundreds of people lined the sidewalk of New Orleans Elementary School leading to the entrance. As that little baby passed, they screamed hateful, words, spiteful slurs, racial slangs. Not only did all the other students withdraw, but almost every teacher resigned in protest. But one teacher stayed to teach young Ruby. And the judge who ordered that Ruby be allowed to attend school also, also assigned Ruby a therapist to monitor her mental health and the mental health of her family. And one day the teacher called to report to the therapist some deviation in Ruby's daily routine. From the school window, the teacher noticed that Ruby 
uh, had stopped and apparently talked to the angry mob outside to greet her each day. And she asked Ruby about the confrontation, but Ruby said she hadn't spoken a word to the crowd, and the therapist agreed to, to meet with her that evening. And as the therapist met with her, she said, Ruby, your teacher's telling me that you stopped and talked to those people. She said, no, sir, I didn't. I didn't talk to them. And he said, well, you stopped in front of them. He said, yeah, but I didn't talk to them. I prayed for them. Ruby said, he said, you prayed for them? And he said, what'd you pray for them? Why'd you pray for them, Ruby? And she said, don't you think they need praying for? I suppose the therapist replied, but why were you praying for them? And that little baby said, because I'm the one who hears what they're saying. And the therapist tried a different approach. He said, what did you pray? And this little six-year-old faced with all that hate and that racism and that sin. That little girl was raised with such a godly mama. This was her prayer. As she stood in front of them, as, as, they, as they called out horrible things to her, she prayed, dear God, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. See, the attitude that you and I take to approaching and dealing with conflict has the potential to make all the difference in the world. All of it. So what I'm about to share with you is a simple blueprint for how we can handle conflict or sin in your personal relationships. This is not necessarily a blueprint for how to handle conflict in the church, although we're going to deal with that in, in the next week or so. Some of the steps will apply. There will be some crossover. But I want to provide you with a blueprint for how to deal with personal conflict because we all have it. And in doing so, we must remember that, that the vast majority of personal conflict that happens in our lives, it, 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 it arises out of the sin of pride in either one or both individuals' hearts. So let's ask the question, how do we deal with conflict? What do we do when we're sinning against? The first step is this. The first step we must take is not the step that you think you would take. When you're in conflict, when someone has sinned against you, the first step I want you to take is to examine yourself and you repent of any lingering sin in your own life first. First. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 5, he says, Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So when you know there's conflict between you and someone else, I want to encourage you before you ever think about addressing conflict with the other person, ask the Lord to reveal any sin in your heart that you need to repent of, and specifically any sin within that relationship that you have. Ask God to reveal that to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you see. Ask for wisdom for the resolution. This step cannot be overemphasized. It cannot uh, be overlooked. Failure to do this part will jeopardize the entire process of conflict management and conflict resolution in your life. Take the time. Be humble enough to say, I may be wrong. Be humble enough to say that. Be humble enough to pray that. The second step is this. Approach the individual with love and grace. And do so one-on-one. -on -one. Matthew 18, 15, Jesus says this, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Go in love and grace. See, a lot of times, this is what happens when we have personal conflict. We go not to resolve the conflict, we simply go to win the battle. Do you see the difference? There's a huge difference in my attitude of how I'm going to respond or the things I'm going to say, of my body language, of how I'm going to allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to minister in my heart and through me, if I go there with an attitude of resolution for the glory of Christ in this Christ-centered relationship, or if I go there with an attitude to win. So go with an attitude of love and go with an attitude of grace, realizing that uh, they need the love and they need the grace just like you need the love and grace of Christ. Towards you. And it might advise you, go go one on one. Here's the deal. The issue is between you and them. It's not between you, them, and your mama. It's not between you, them, and your best friend. It's not between you, them, and the prayer line at church. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you first to come to a resolution. The third step I, I want to encourage you to do is to be direct. 
Don't beat around the bush. Be direct. And this is key. Be gentle when confronting sin and dealing with conflict. Look, it, it does no good to beat around the bush and not say what's wrong. And, 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 and part of the thing I have to, I've had to learn my whole life is just the way I grew up. Uh, we, just, we just threw everything on the table. We just threw it against the wall and whatever stuck, you, that's what you dealt with. We, it, wasn't, it wasn't no gentleness. It wasn't no tactfulness. It was just, uh, hey, you're stupid and this is the problem. Please don't say those words to another person. That will only exacerbate the problem that you have. Right? When you're direct, you say, hey, when you did this, this is what I experienced. When you, send it, when you said this, when you did this, when you didn't do this, this is what happened to me. And this is how I feel. This is my emotions right now. This is what I've been thinking. This is how it impacted and affected my life. But I, I, I want to caution you to do so with gentleness. Galatians 6.1, Paul says this. Brethren, if anyone is called in any trespass, and that's what a conflict between people is. It's a trespass of trust in the relationship, right? You who are spiritual, restore one in such a spirit of gentleness. There will be many who will want to be passive-aggressive with this step, who will shy away from addressing wrongs, but doing so only allows the situation to grow. You can be direct and you can be gentle at the same time. Is it difficult to do sometimes? Absolutely. Don Shula, past coach of the Miami Dolphins, was talking to a reporter about players' practices and their mistakes in practice. He says, we never, ever, ever, ever know how, no matter how small, we never let a mistake go unchallenged. Uncorrected errors multiply. And, and the reporter was kind of astonished. He said, isn't there a benefit in, in, in overlooking one small flaw? And Coach Shula said, what is a small flaw? I think of that all day long. He said, what is a small flaw? I see that in my children. He said, I, as a dad, I've let a lot of things slide because I was too tired. I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't think it was worth it. And I've come to regret it years later. He said, if I could do it all over again, Coach Shula said, with my children, I'd face the errors on the spot. It's easier on them and it's easier on you. That works in relationships with anyone. If there's something going on under the surface, something you sense, just bring it out and say, hey, I think I've sinned against you. Or, or, hey, I think you may have sinned against me. Face it right then. Face it right there. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.15, he says, when someone has sinned against you, what they've done, they've disobeyed the word of God and sinned against you. But listen to what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians. This is really interesting. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. See it again, the attitude. When someone hurts you, when they sin against you, when they're in conflict against you, do you automatically think that person is your enemy? Or do you consider that person to be your brother, your sister in Christ? It changes the whole way in which you and I approach conflict. See, remember the person that you're talking to, the person that you may be in discord with, remember this, they are a child of God. So grant them the grace and grant them the mercy and seek the reconciliation and restoration for the glory of God. The fourth step is this, in regards to the party which is in the wrong, if you're in the wrong, if you realize you're in the wrong, whether on your own or if somebody brings something to your attention, whether you've been wrong, I want to... I want to give you, uh, humbly give you this advice. Be ready and willing to repent. If you're wrong, you're going to need to humble yourself before God. You're going to need to humble yourself before your brother, your sister, and ask for forgiveness. And it may be that both parties need to do this in the presence of one another. James tells us in James 5, 16, he says, Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. You see how relationships are healed? Through mutual confession and repentance. And John reminds us in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so you may be confronted with the reality of your sin. Be humble. Because this is what happens when you and I are confronted with our sin. We will want to do this every single time. And I want to caution you again. This is where humility, this is where the original sin of pride comes into play. When you're confronted with a mistake, whether it's something you said or something you did, something you forgot to do. Maybe it was in the heat of a moment. Maybe it was a long, drawn-out, protracted habit of sin. It doesn't matter. 
you are going to want to qualify and justify your mistakes to that person. Give them the rationale for why you do it and why they shouldn't take it so serious, why it's not that big of a deal. But here, here's the reality of the situation. If that person is coming to you and addressing something to you, it's a big deal to them. It may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to them. Husbands and wives, this is something in marriage we got to learn, we got to practice very well. If your spouse brings something into you, guess what? When they've done that, whatever you said, whatever you did, whatever you didn't do, it's been a big deal to them. Listen, understand. Don't try to fix. Don't try to qualify. Don't try to justify. If you're wrong, just say, I promise you, there's such freedom in saying the words. It may sound counterintuitive, but there's freedom in saying, I was wrong. I'm sorry. So that's the the fourth step I I, want to remind you that. And if you're the guilty party in a position, there might need to be penance or amends or compensation to to make it right. Matthew 19, I love Matthew 19. It provides an example of Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus? He was saved by Jesus and his salvation, and he recognized he had wronged people, that he had stolen from people. Look at his heart. Listen to this in, in, in Matthew 19, verse 8. Zacchaeus stood up and said, he said, Lord, look, I give half of my goods to the poor, and I've taken anything from anybody by false accusation. I restore fourfold. So if you're confronted with, the, with, with your sin, one of the most effective things we can do to respond and therefore restore unity is humble repentance. The fifth step in dealing with conflict in your life is be ready to bear burdens. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 6. We looked at verse 1 and verse 2. We'll add to this. Brothers, if anyone is called in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch yourself lest you too be tempted Listen to what he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Many times in dealing with conflict in your life and my life, you're going to find yourself in a position. You're going to find yourself in a position where you can get back at the person who wronged you. You can hurt them. You may be tempted to get even. You may justify in your head and your heart that you need to get right. Doing doing so, it will feel right in the moment, but doing so violates the law of Christ shown to you. It violates the example of Jesus that he has given us. Sometimes what's going to happen, you're going to feel real weird about this. This is not going to feel natural. It's not going to feel normal because it goes against everything the world says do. But sometimes when we're addressing conflict, when we're seeking resolution, what's going to happen, you're going to be in the position to help bear the burden of the person who sinned against you. And it's the most Christ-like thing that you can do in that moment. It will be the hardest thing to do but it's the most thing that you can do like Christ. In, in that position, you literally are the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ as you help bear the burden of the person. But even in this, Paul cautions, be strong, remain cautious, alert to the sin that we are not taken captive by sin ourselves. And the sixth step, and this is the hardest step. This is the absolute hardest step. Be ready to cut ties if you have to. Many think that as a follower of Christ, you're supposed to put up with anything and everything, but that's simply not biblical. In writing to Titus, Paul says this in Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Paul says this, Reject a divisive person after a first and a second warning, knowing that such a person is perverted and sins, being self-condemned. The Message Bible puts it this way. I like this paraphrase. He says, Warn a quarrelsome person once or twice, but then be done with them. It's obvious that such a person is out of line, rebellious against God. By persisting in divisiveness, he cuts himself off. And we've all had people in our lives that consistently cause trouble and stir up mess in one way or another, financially, relationally, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. They always seem to find their way into other people's lives. They always seem to be the one with the problem. They always seem to find the fault in someone else. The problem is never theirs. Any any attempt to, to, to fix the problem is seen as judgment. They can't believe you would approach them with such a thing, right? The Bible says make two, and when we, we put this with what else we've talked about, we make godly attempts to correct and address And if if in loving correction, they're still divisive, they're still causing problems, they're still causing conflict, Paul says, cut them out of your circle of influence. You've done everything you can. You don't stop praying for them, 
But there's no need to allow that person to infect your life and infect the life of those you love if they're continually causing conflict without repentance. So as we look at these six steps, we see they're for our personal life. And I, I, I'm going to put a disclaimer. Following these six steps are not going to guarantee you continued fellowship. They're not going to guarantee you restoration or reconciliation. They're not. It's not guaranteed. But they're biblical principles that God has given us that will allow us to honor Christ as we try to reconcile and pursue Christ-centered relationships in our life. How different might our relationships be? How different might conflict resolution be if we applied these principles? But before our team comes up, let me ask you this question. There may be some of you here right now, and, and your largest conflict in your life is not with people, but it's with God. You may be a person like the prodigal son. You have a relationship with God, but you're mad at God for some reason. He let you down in some way. He didn't answer prayer the way you thought it was going to be answered. Maybe a loved one was taken too soon. Maybe, maybe disease and physical pain has rocked your body and you can't get over it. Maybe you have some shattered relationships that you're blaming God for. Beloved, I want to encourage you to come back home. God is not in conflict with you. He's a loving Father. And we sang of His goodness and His mercy this morning. He is calling you to come back home to Him. And if you're here this morning, you don't have a relationship with God. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that all those who stand outside of a relationship with God are what he calls children. The Bible calls children of wrath. You are standing at the throne of heaven facing the wrath of God because you're not in a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Now, God doesn't desire you to be in conflict with him. He doesn't. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you're a kid here. It doesn't matter if you're in junior high school and college. It doesn't matter what age you are. You may be a young adult. You may be a, a senior adult. It doesn't matter. You need to understand that, that you are in conflict with God, and God does not desire to be in conflict with you because he sent his own son to die for you that you might not be in conflict with him, but that you might be reconciled unto him through Jesus Christ. And if that's you this morning, I want, I want to call on you. I want to plead with you to give your life to Christ this morning. Simply, the Bible says all we have to do is ask God to forgive us of our sins, believe that Jesus died for us, and we will be reconciled to God. Because the same principle is true in our personal relationships with our relationship with God. If we respond with humility and grace to the offer of the gospel, the Holy Spirit works and provides reconciliation. As our team comes, would you join with me this morning? Would you stand? We've talked a lot about conflict this morning. We've got a couple more weeks on it to look at some specific aspects of it. But this morning, we talked about conflict in our, in our personal lives, how we respond to conflict. And you may be a person, you're here and you're in personal conflict, and you may be the one that has, has sinned. Can I call on you to practice this humility and repent? Maybe the person that you've sinned against is, is, is in, at this church this morning. And maybe you need to get with them before you leave today and, and make that right and have that difficult conversation and, and practice this humility. Maybe you've been the person who's sinned against. Would you be willing to practice humility in your own life and gentleness and bearing burdens? And if any of us here stand in conflict with the Lord, May we be made right through a humble repentance in Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray, and as we sing, we're going to give you a chance to respond. Maybe you're here, and you need to just come pray. We'd love to pray with you. We're going to have pastors up here. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you need to just sit down where you're at and just have some time alone with the Lord. That's fine. Maybe you've made a decision about joining our church or following through in Believer's Baptism. We'd love to help walk you through that. But, beloved, we gather here to hear the word of God, to exalt God as we respond to his word. And so we don't want to leave here without responding to the word of God. So I'm going to pray, and as we sing, would you respond? Father God, thank you for the, the word you've given us this morning. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your, your grace, God. Thank you, God, that the ultimate conflict that we have with you, that you've taken care of in Jesus. And if any of us here, God, have conflict with you, that you would help, help us see our need to humble ourselves. 
And God, as we try to have Christ-centered relationships, exalt you in all of our relationship with friends and with family, with co-workers, with church members. God, would you help us honor you as we seek to reconcile these relationships? We ask this in Jesus' name.